Um, we're going to be in Romans chapter 5 this morning as we are moving along in our study of the epistle of Paul to the church at Rome. Uh, a couple of quick notes before we get to the word. Uh, one is uh, Jody Van Oss's mother has passed away in the last couple of days. Some of you have been praying for her with respect to that. So be aware of that and lift them up in your prayers. And please, as you plan out your holidays ahead and next weekend, understand that uh, there will be no Sunday school on November 27. So no Sunday school. We'll meet here at 1015, uh, but uh, nothing at 9 o'clock ahead of that. We're in Romans 5, verse 1, and I invite you to follow along in your scripture sheet, in your bulletin, or your own Bible, whatever uh, works for you, and hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exalt in hope of the glory of God. And we'll stop there, at least for now. There are so many great, great words in those two verses that you and I can cherish, but I would have us begin with the first word in Romans chapter 5, and it is the word, therefore. It is a conjunction, it is a transitional word, it is intended to connect for the reader what is about to be said with what has preceded. It suggests some logical connection. We read the word therefore, and we ask wherefore. We ask therefore, or what is the therefore, therefore. It is a word that is especially utilized in the writings of the great theologian of the infant church, the esteemed Apostle Paul, why in the book of Romans we encounter that word therefore 20 times. And it comes at strategic moments in the flow of the letter and the gospel argument that it contains. Now a, a quick survey may help us appreciate Paul's favorite conjunction. After indicating that humanity failed in the central duty of honoring God, Paul says this, Romans 1, 24, Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity. And in the same flow of argument, Paul then answers objectors by writing in chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore you have no excuse. In addition to uh, our text for today, in this fifth chapter, we see the word again <coughs> in verse 12 of chapter 5. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. We're going to get to that uh, soon enough. Uh, but you see how the apostle uses the word therefore to connect his ideas to demonstrate their consistency. So after saying more about the good news, he offers this in chapter 6 and verse 4. Therefore, we have been buried with him, with Christ, through baptism and the death. Eleven verses later, or, or nine, eight verses later, I guess, of verse 12 of that chapter. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. Repeating the good news, he comes back to our justification in Romans 8 and verse 1, where it says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And maybe my favorite use of the conjunction in Romans, as Paul, it comes in chapter 12, um, where Paul goes from telling us all that Jesus has done for us, and then he turns it around to speak of our response to the grace of God. Romans 12, verse 1, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. And so I ask you again today, what is the therefore, therefore? To show you how the Christian faith all fits together and makes sense. Paul takes his reader from glory to glory. He shows us how one element of the gospel leads to the next. He's been showing us the way of justification through faith in Jesus. And he's about to transition. But the transition is marked out by this phrase, having been justified by faith. You got that? Having 
been. I've labored in previous weeks to explain that justification for us as believers is a done deal. It's not something that we're only hoping for at the end of this life. It is a completed work that we celebrate and live out right now. So here he does not say, therefore, hoping to be justified by faith. No, no. It says, having been justified by faith. Our justification, it is the finished work of Jesus, and it is a completed work. It now forms for us the context for what follows, and that is, as described here, the gift of peace with God. But the context of that peace is our justification, so we can call that point number one, if you're following on your outline. Our next, and I suppose our primary point for today, is the gift of peace. So what a glorious affirmation we encounter in chapter 5. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul puts this in here as something for us to know, as something that is far from obvious, as something that is news, that is great news. But if I came here today and announced to you all, fellow Americans, let's celebrate. We are now at peace with Canada. How many of you would be excited by that? Well, no one would, and why is that? That's because you were not aware that we were at conflict with Canada or that they were any kind of threat to us at all. An announcement of peace suggests that the parties involved have been in conflict, which we have, and the conflict addressed here is between us and God. Verse 11 will speak of our reconciliation with God, which again implies that there was, before reconciliation, there was what? There was enmity. If you've read what comes before in the book of Romans, (coughs) you already know all about this because Paul has labored for chapters to tell us about it. Chapter 1 announced that God was angry with you, that you were hostile toward God. There is and was this barrier to peace, and it's on both sides of the relationship. The gospel addresses God's enmity toward us through this thing we called propitiation and expounded for you. It also addresses our enmity via regeneration, the changing of the human heart. But so many people fail to grasp this reality, the reality of their need for reconciliation with God. They might say something like, oh my, no, no, pastor, I'm certainly not hostile to God, but scripture says that you are, and you likely don't know it because it is just the water that you swim in. Fish probably don't think that they are swimming, that they are in water because it is always their reality. It's all they have ever known. But it is this alienation from God that is the context and explanation of all of the brokenness that we experience in our world, even the brokenness described in that video that we just watched, and your particular brokenness in your life and in your family, we see how troubled relationships are, how cultures are sick, how individual lives are disordered, and we wonder why. Well, Scripture gives us the answer. We have separated ourselves from God by our sinful choices, and we are reaping the fruit of those sinful choices. The prophet Isaiah said numerous times, there is no peace for the wicked. But now, Paul comes with good news. Peace has come, peace of the most central and significant variety, peace with the Lord who made us, with the Lord who is our judge, and where does that peace come from? It doesn't come from some endeavor of human beings. We lack the disposition to even try to reconcile. And if we had tried to reconcile with God, we lack the means for doing so. But the point of Romans is that what we could not do, God did. You don't make your peace with God. 
Jesus made that peace for you. So Paul in Ephesians says this, chapter 2, verse 14, Christ himself has brought peace to us. Or, as the NAS puts it, he himself is our peace. This is what is behind the little prepositional phrase in our text, through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's not a throwaway phrase. That's very important. It is through him, through Jesus, for all the reasons we have been learning in recent weeks. He is our redemption. He is our propitiation. He took care of the wrath of the Father for you and for me. And then he imputes his righteousness to us. Our peace comes through the blood of the cross. So what kind of peace are we talking about here? You understand, there's a lot of words that get thrown out, like love and peace is another one. Very flexible terms, right? Very flexible. It can refer to something internal to a person. We speak of inner tranquility as a type of peace. And we might call that the peace of God. You may know Philippians 4, which says that when you pray, or if you pray, uh, the peace of God, surpass, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So that's a type of peace, the peace of God. But then the word peace also refers to a relationship between two or more parties. In this case, the parties would be God and the sinner. The apostle says, now there is peace with God, not the peace of God, but peace with God. The enmity is over. The barriers that we erected against God are now removed. This peace with God that is announced in our text, well, that's the starting point for all spiritual blessings. Without this, you have nothing. And you are destined for destruction, which means that there is an obvious relationship between having peace with God and enjoying the peace of God. You cannot have true peace within if you are at odds with your maker. Carl Jung, the psychologist, said this, no one can live in a house he knows is shortly to t- No one can live at peace in a house he knows is shortly to tumble about his ears. Now, for some of you, the things necessary for peace, those things are not realities for you. You have no peace with God, for you are still in your sin. You've never turned from that sin. You've never trusted in Christ. You should not have peace. You have every reason to be fretful, to worry, to fear. St. Augustine was famous for saying that God has made us for himself, and we shall be then forever restless until we find our rest in him. I hear of the great preacher of a generation past in the Philly area, Donald Gray Barnhouse, that he used to give an unusual benediction at the end of every service at 10th Presbyterian Church. He would call down God's peace on those who love Christ, and then he would say, and if you do not, may the Lord visit you with restlessness until you find your rest in Him. And for you who do not know Christ, who do not know his peace, that's my prayer for you, that your conscience would be troubled, would be pained until you bow the knee before the Lord of glory, until you come to rest indeed in him. For others of you, maybe uh, you have experienced peace with God, but you're lacking the peace of God. You're not enjoying peace within. That's a possibility. It's a fruit of weak faith. Things are good with you and the Father, but the devil has managed to sow doubts, and you have not vigorously nurtured your soul, so you are not experiencing one of the great blessings of trust in Christ. Joseph Scribner wrote in the mid-19th century these lyrics you may know, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to do what? To carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. What's his point? 
As believers in Christ, we have peace with God, and it's a peace that can deliver us from fear and from anxiety, but our failure to use the means of grace, such as prayer, has left us vulnerable to the unnerving lies that come to us from the enemy of our souls. So you cannot have peace of God without the peace with God, but you can have peace with God and lack the peace of God. But the more we grasp the riches of our peace with God, the more likely we are to experience the peace of God. (coughs) And if you understood that, please say amen. (laughs) So all of that was about the gift of peace. It implies a previous hostility. It comes through Jesus Christ. It is peace with God. Now we move on to the next gift, which Paul will unwrap for us. And this is the privilege of peace, which is access. Many versions of Romans use that word there in verse 2. The New American Standard that I use actually uses the word introduction. There may not be the perfect word to depict what is conveyed here, at least not in English. Paul is saying that we have been introduced by another, namely Jesus, into a place where we may have access to the presence and the goodness of our Heavenly Father. I like the New Living Translation on this one, verse 2 of chapter 5. Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege. (laughs) I love that. Uh, I, I long for us to grasp how privileged we are as believers. Here the privilege is that of just being with, that of communing with our, with our Lord. The word translated introduction or access is also found in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. There he says this, chapter 2, verse 18. Through him, Christ, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. Now this is one of the most wonderful concepts in all of God's word. Christ has won for us through his perfect life and his sacrificial death, not only the forgiveness of our sins, but also peace with God, but actual personal access to the living Lord himself. You remember how when Jesus died, the veil of the temple, that veil that separated sinful men from the holy of holies, that veil was split from top to bottom. Hebrews 10 talks about then a new access that we have found to the Father by the death of Christ. Hebrews 10, 19, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And the new and living way of approach to God is access to God. Ephesians 3.12, one other verse on this. We have boldness and confident access through faith in Him. So this envisions access to our holy and loving Father. Now uh, imagine in, in, with me uh, a busy executive who is in his office, the company president, and he has people lined up in his outer office hoping, waiting to see him. Some have been there almost an hour just hoping for a few minutes with this powerful man and they as they watch into the office bounds this seven-year-old boy who runs right past all of them, walks right past the secretary and directly into the office of the president and not only that, directly onto his lap. That is the access of a child to a father, a special privilege of that status. That's a picture of what we are given by Christ. I think, too, of a term we sometimes use in our online world. Perhaps you sign up for something on the internet, maybe a special presentation of a, of a new film that's coming out, and you try, to, you try to get into the movie on your computer, but you're blocked, and sometimes they ask you for what? They ask you for an access code. Without that code, you're blocked out and you are frustrated. But then you figure out how to get one of those. And that code allows you entrance into the website. Access. So, what is the access code for us through the gospel? 
Well, lots of directions I could go with that one, but I'm going to suggest something like this. That is uh, what we call the ichthus. Uh, it's more than a bumper sticker. This represented an early creed of the church. Now, ichthus is the Greek word for fish, but it is an acrostic. So the five letters there stand for Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. And if you have any difficulty getting into the presence and around the blessing of your maker, try that access code. You hold up your ichthus and say, I am a follower of Jesus Christ, God's Son, my Savior. And when you do that, you know what happens? The green check mark appears, and the doors are open, and you will find yourself in this wonderful place of privilege. At least if that faith represented by the ichthus is a reality in your heart and not just on the back of your car. So there is in the Old Testament a fascinating story of gaining access. It is in the book of Esther. Esther was the Jewish lady who became a queen of sorts under King Ahasuerus of Persia. Uh, at least she was one of his wives. Uh, and, and then as providence would have it, a member of the Persian cabinet hatched a plot designed to kill many of the Jews that were living in, in that land. Well, being a Jew, Esther was, of course, quite concerned. So at the urging of her uncle, she decided to utilize uh, her position uh, to influence the king away from such a wicked plan. But her position did not guarantee her acceptance. She may have been in the harem, but approaching the king was still apparently risky business if you do not have an invitation to do so. Nevertheless, as you know the story, after much prayer, uh, she takes this bold step. She enters the royal presence in hope that the king would extend to her his royal scepter, which apparently was the symbol of favor and acceptance. And so we read of this in Esther chapter 5, verse 1. It came about on the third day, Esther put on her royal robes, stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's rooms, and the king was sitting on the royal throne in the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. When the king saw Esther the queen standing in the court, she obtained favor in his sight, and the king extended to Esther the golden scepter which was in his hand. So Esther came near and touched the top of the scepter. And from that place of privilege, she was able to speak her petitions to the king with the end result that her people were rescued. In a sense, if you think about it, Esther is one of those great Old Testament figures of the coming Christ. Her access to the king, rooted in... In, in her case, in her beauty, flowing out of the king's delight in her, that became access for all of her people, and that access meant the difference for many, literally, between life and death. One more phrase to consider, and we'll be done. Verse 2 says this, Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. The New American Standard says, into this grace in which we stand. Well, I know physically you're sitting, but I'm asking you this question, where are you standing today? Where are you placing your weight? 1 Corinthians 15, 1, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you do what? You stand. Stand. It's a very popular word in the New Testament. Often it comes with the modifier firm, as in stand firm. That suggests to us an image of combat. You know, we, we brace ourselves for an attack with the intention of maintaining our, uh, our ground and fending off the assault of the enemy. 
Here, however, I think Paul just has in view the simple choice that we all make concerning personal alignment, right? Now, during the political campaigns, some will put signs in their yard that basically are saying what? You know, I stand with John. I stand with Carrie. Popular in the summer were shirts and memes that said, I stand with Ukraine. It is a way of declaring which side you are on, where your allegiance lies. Right? Does that choice make a difference? Oh my, does it ever. The apostle announces that Jesus provides for us a place of grace which we may enter by faith. And then in that place of grace, we affirm, I stand with Jesus. That, that won't always win us friends. It may win us enemies. It may win us powerful enemies. But in the final analysis, when the day of judgment comes... This is the only place that you want to be found, standing in the grace, standing in your undeserved privilege, singing from the heart the praise of your Savior. And so I ask you today, where are you standing on this Sunday morning? Good news, good news, it is possible to change sides. It is possible to align with Christ and join us in this place of privilege which we surely did not, do not deserve. The great thing about Christian privilege, unlike other forms of privilege, is that it is open to everybody. Final word. There's a verse in Revelation in a section depicting judgments to come upon the earth. And it says this, Revelation 6, 17, the great day of wrath has come. And who is able to what? To stand. What's the answer to that? Those who stand in the grace of Jesus. So we're going to close in prayer. And I'm going to ask you to stand. (laughs) As we do as symbolic that we are standing with our Savior. And so, Lord, again, we celebrate the grace that we have read in Romans. We celebrate the peace that you provide to those who trust in Christ, how you have removed our hostility by your Spirit, how you have removed the barriers against our acceptance by the work of Jesus on our behalf and his death and his resurrection. And once again this morning, we rejoice in these things. We celebrate these things. Our hearts are refreshed and restored in our meditations upon these things. And Lord, we do long to stand in the grace of Jesus. We are with him. We are for him. We are His, and we rejoice that He is ours. And Lord, when difficulties come our way, give us grace to stand. When judgment day comes, give us grace to stand. When we cross the rivers of this life into the other world, give us grace to stand and to know that as we stand with Jesus, He is always and certainly going to stand with us as our defender and our Savior and our benevolent king. Lord, may we also be able to graciously speak of his grace to those who we share thanksgiving with this week, whether it's family or friends or whoever it may be. Give us hearts that witness to the privilege that we have and that it is because of Jesus and his mercy and his grace and nothing that we have done and nothing that we are. Give us joy now as we sing of Christ. We pray in his name. Amen.